everybody. It's a great pleasure for me to be here today to tell you about my research and to discuss with you the logic of life. So let's start. So in 2001, it's 18 years ago, the human genome was initially assembled, was sequenced, assembled, and it was celebrated in a press conference with, by then, American President Bill Clinton, Craig Venter, Francis Collins. And since then, we have known that our genome, the human genome, contains roughly three billion bases in this code of four letters, A, C, G, T, spread out over 22 chromosomes and the sex chromosome X and Y. Uh, humans being diploid, we have, of course, two copies of this whole arrangement of genetic information. But we can also ask then, how well do we understand the genome now 18 years later? How well can we interpret it and I would like you to give you a sort of a detailed zoom in here on just one small piece. Here I show you 200,000 kb, uh, 200,000 base pairs, I mean, uh, on chromosome 1 around coordinates 146 million. This is a gene-rich area, so I just indicated where protein coding genes are located here in green, uh, spanning this, this low side. Where the genes are, we know well, I mean, we can identify protein coding genes. We know about the sequence motifs that are present in various parts of the gene structures that indicates uh, the, the sort of the location, and we know how it participates in function. So, if you zoom in on one gene here called TXNIP, it's located there. If you zoom that up, you can see the exon infrastructure. We know which parts are coding, are coding for protein, which parts are, are not, the interspersed non coding introns. One can also directly see in, in this plot, even if we didn't understand the sequence motifs that specify gene structures, we could find the genes, the protein coding genes, very easily by just aligning the human genome to closely related organisms. Rhesus monkey, if you go down to mouse or chicken or frog, and that's what's shown here in these darker colors, are the part of this gene loci that is conserved down to these organisms. And if one sounds the conservation over 100 different vertebrates, you can clearly see that you could predict where all the coding part of these genes is, simply based on conservation alone. And we also know, to some extent, or fairly well, I would argue, how to interpret genetic variation that lies within these coding parts of genes. For example, if we look at exon 4 here, uh, there's been a point mutation identified in certain human individuals that renders the, the translation of this loci incomplete. So when the DNA is converted initially to RNA and later to protein, of course we know the triple code, so we, we understand that this base pair variation leads to a, a stop codon. The protein will get truncated. We also know that the RNA machinery itself probably already removes this RNA before it even reaches the, the, the translational part in our RNA quality control systems. So that's all very good. We know this part very well. We know that there's roughly 20,000 such protein coding genes spread out over our genetic material. And for example, this base pair, as I said, was identified by colleagues here at Karolinska very recently, and it's been, if you, if you lack both functional copies from both your, your parents, you have metabolic uh, problems and, and <coughs> as a consequence of this. So knowing the genes is good, but it would be even better if you could understand when are genes used in our bodies. Um, of course, all the cells in our bodies don't express all the genes, they express only a subset of the genome that is important for the function of various cells. So where is that information coded? Well, that's in the, the regulatory regions, they are numerous, they are on the order of a million or so, so they are much more numerous than the genes themselves. Some of these regions are predicted, some of them we know very well where they are, and they, are, they come in two sort of big flavors. If you look at the sequence directly upstream of where genes are being, at genes start, the so-called promoter region, we know that there are certain kinds of sequence motifs here that are the, the docking sites of the proteins that, that drive gene expression here. We know the top of box, the initiator, then we know the factors that bind there. Even though these are rare events, most 
genes don't have these, these elements in their promoters. But the vast majority of regulatory regions lie, however, far away from the genes they regulate themselves. Uh, so, for example, if you look at this block here, it's a regulatory region. We don't know from the sequence alone here which of these genes are being regulated by this sequence. And all these regulatory regions that lie further away from the, from the, from the genes we call enhancers. So we can experimentally demonstrate that the enhancers are very important. We can take this piece of information here, this genetic material, we put it in front of a reporter gene, and we make a genetically engineered mouse, mouse for example. Then we can directly visualize, for example, during development that is shown here, or later in the adult stages, which cells at what time point in development is this element driving gene expression. And some of them can show up here, like in the areas that will later become the spinal cord or in brain structures. And each of these elements here codes for a different functionality. So one can look at whole panels of these enhancers, and some give rise to more specific structures, some are more broadly used. But the problem here is that even though we can, you know, this is laborious experiments, you know, you have to generate a transgenic mouse for each of these one million elements. So that's not really a feasible strategy. Of course, we would like to be able to read the sequence here and understand what it codes for. And here's where the problem starts. Even though if we scan the sequence that are inside these elements, they are often a few hundred base pairs long, we can recognize that yeah, it contains small motifs. By, by motifs, I just mean a small combination of, of A, C, G, and Ts that we know are preferentially bound by specific DNA binding factors. But they seem to occur pretty much everywhere. And they also occur very frequently outside of enhancers. And we don't, we cannot, from sequence alone, predict the gene they regulate or when in time or in what cell type they will do the job. Is this important? I think it's very important to be able to make improvements in this area for what we have learned from not only sequencing the human genome, but sequence animals of all kinds, you know, down to marine organisms, even unicellular eukaryotes, we know that we essentially share the same genes, right? There's some variations. We expand some, we deplete some, but there's not much innovation in terms of the genes we have. The innovation that comes is how the genes are used, and the blocks of, of sort of gene regulatory networks are, are reused and put into different <laughs> places to generate variations in forms and functions. And that's, of course, all coded in what you can say the regulatory wiring or the rewiring between species. And this is a daunting challenge because we know that in our genome then it has 20,000 protein coding genes Roughly a thousand of them can bind DNA, some of them very specifically and some more broadly. And they can, in, in, after being expressed, then they can act back on the genome and modulate the expression of other genes. But one can start to map out these processes in some kind of a regulatory wiring ramps where different transcription factors, how they regulate other genes. But oh, this is, we have very limited such information, and only in places where groups have spent decades to map out which regulatory elements are the ones being used by which factor. So if you really would like to you know, understand the logic of life, we need to understand how to decode the regulatory information that are present in our human genome. So how do we achieve this? So, as a starter, I would argue, uh, we would need to know where are genes expressed, because that's sort of the output we need to correlate the input to. We need to understand which regulatory regions are active in the same cells, and we need to know the, the proteins that act on the genome in the same cells. Yep. And the challenge was here that when I started my own lab here at the Karolinska, that was in 2008, so a while back, the ways we could measure where genes are expressed were, compared to today's standards, very crude. We needed on the order of 100,000 cells in order to measure in a genome-wide manner where genes are expressed. 
So if you go to any kind of tissue, which we know are built up by many kinds of specialized cells, we would simply get an average. And that's illustrated in this painting by Seurat here. So if you would look at the brain, of course, you will get the average of a lot of different distinct cell types. So what my lab sought out to do is to come up with strategies where we can you know, not look at it on the order of the whole tissue, but rather take apart the cell constituents into individual cells, profile the RNA, which is a proxy then of which genes are expressed, and later, if we do that in many cells, the patterns of which genes they express could reveal what kind of cells they are, and also, of course, then which genes are expressed in these cells. That would only solve one of these two free problems, but at least it was the starting point a decade ago. So in, in my lab, we, we worked initially together with a, a research department in California with, uh, under Illumini, with Gary Schrott and Shuyun Liu, and together, we published the first, one of the first single-cell RNA sequencing methods by them, then called SmartSeq. So these are early days, 2012, so it's seven years ago. The initial experiments, we only had 12 cells, so four cells each picked from three different kinds of cells. But just to sort of develop the method and understand how many of the genes expressed in these cells can we actually capture, and, and the fact that cells separate based on the total pattern of expression they contain. And around this time, when I first uh, talked about this goal, it was actually met with quite a, quite a lot of skepticism, because people say that, I mean, cells are all different, right? They sell, they cycle, they are exposed to a lot of different <coughs> extracellular cues. Is there any chance to even have a signal that can actually override all of this biology occurring? But it's actually... This concept, as you will see in the next slide, has been extremely powerful and really works. From there on, my lab developed a method called SmartSeq2 the year after, where we really made this much, much better. And uh, still, six years later, it's still one of the most used methods around the world for single-cell RNA sequencing, because we cannot really do the highest number of cells, but we still give the most detailed picture from individual cells in terms of what genes are, are being expressed. So, just to give you a flavor of where this general field is today, so my lab, this is just two examples of studies we did a few years back then, just to, to try this out. We went into the, looked at the human pancreas. If you break it up, take out the, the Langerhorn Islands, pick those cells individually, sequence their RNA, can we make sense of it? And the data actually falls very easily into the clusters of cells that reflect the known you know, endocrine populations here, so insulin-producing beta cells, glucagon-producing alpha cells, and so forth, and the same concept in different kinds of immune cells. And these general methods are being utilized now on a very broad scale, and this is showing a, a meta-analysis of mouse data profiled with, with, with SmartSeq2, over hundreds of thousands of cells, and each of these clusters then reflect either a cell type or a certain activity state of cells. So we are well underway here in terms of you know, applying these technologies broadly to human, for example, in the human cell atlas, to, cata to, to get the catalog on what cell states and types exist and which genes are expressed in each of them. So that's a fantastic <coughs> development. It's, it's been really fast and it's been extremely fun to, to be part of. But what I would like to tell you more about is actually something else we learned while working with this single-cell gene expression data. So I told you initially that the human genome, we inherit a set of chromosomes from your father and one from your mother, so we have two copies of each. So for any particular gene here, it could either be expressed from both the maternal, so the mother's or the father's copy, that it's biallelically, or it's only expressed from one of them, and it would be monoallelic expressed, that's the terminology we would use. And we know that imprinted genes are monoallelic expressed, and, and sex chromosomes have a very intricate such regulation, of course. But something that struck us in one of the early works from my lab, where we did a single-cell analysis of mouse pre-implantation development, so fertilized egg until the early stages of development, before the embryo is implanted into the, into the 
the uterus. So what we realize then is when you look at any particular gene, for quite many of them, we only detect RNA from either the mother or the father's allele. So if you will quantify it, so roughly 25% of the, the, the genes we see in each cell, we would only see from, from one of the alleles. And if you look at the embryo here, this is sort of a cartoon of that, and for any particular gene, the different cells would either have them expressed from both parents or only from one, in a seemingly random pattern. And sort of the, the general idea then was that around this time is still that most genes are expressed from both alleles because we are so used to look at cell populations. And if you combine all of this, of course, you will always have expression of both. And there was also confusion whether such kind of patterns are somehow inherited in cells or if they are just reflection on stochastic biology occurring in cells. So to formally address this, we made an experiment where we, we looked at fibroblasts in mice and T cells in humans. We looked at unrelated cells picked randomly and we sequenced them. And then we took out individual cells, we expanded them in culture and we took the progeny of those cells that we know are clonally related. And then we can just ask, are there any patterns that are shared among these cells to a higher degree than cells in general have sharing with each other? And the simple question, the simple answer here is pretty much that there is not much. All of these patterns are random. X chromosome activation is our positive control that is a screamingly strong signal that they are always clonally inherited. But that we know, of course, from a from long time ago. So instead, what we saw that became the interest point of the lab for, for a while is that when you're down to the single cell level, you actually see the dynamics that occur in cells as, as genes are being expressed. So if this is a single cell over time here in this direction, there is RNA is being generated from the, the mother's and the father's allele sometime over time here, and they're being degraded. And these kind of ideas then are, are based on this sort of ideas of transcriptional bursts, that there will be a few episodic events of transcription occurring of a certain size, which is called the burst size then, how many RNA molecules are generated when we turn on a gene. And the frequency will become then, how often do we turn on the gene? How many such bursts happen over a certain time interval? And this is very different from the traditional way of looking at it, where we simply would just average them out, even from single cell data, and just say, yes, we have a mean expression here, which of course is in relation to the burst, but it doesn't really capture the dynamics, of course. So more recently in the lab, we developed a, a sort of a statistical inference strategy to, to use single cell RNA sequencing data to try to infer back the dynamics so for each gene, we would like to pinpoint what is the, the burst size and the frequency. How many molecules are generated when it's turned on, and how often does it become expressed? It's, it's a very fundamental feature of gene expression itself. Um, so here is, in, again, fibroblast only, as the starting cell type. Each dot here, red dot, is one gene which we have inferred the kinetics for in the space then of, of burst size and, and frequency. And I will just tell you in a few slides what we learned from this. We learned that the size for most genes are typically between 0 and 10 molecules, that you seldom generate more than 10 RNA molecules in the same burst, with exceptions. And we also learned that the transcriptional events are fairly rare, so per allele, most genes are perhaps being expressed within a few hours of, of the last burst. So you have to wait maybe three, four hours between burst on average, for genes that are moderately high, or high expressed. If it's a low expressed gene, you can have to wait much, much longer than that. But what we really learned about this, which now start to connect back to the regulatory nature of our genome, is how is the transcriptional bursting encoded in our genome? And what we could see is that if you if we divide up the genes by the types of elements they have in their core promoters, so tautaboxes, initiator elements, 
we can see that genes that have a Tata box in the promoter, in blue here, have a significantly higher birth size than genes that don't have that. And that there are synergistic effects between the Tata box and the initiator, that if you have both, you have an even higher birth size. And interestingly, this could not be seen at the level of mean expression. So this is the similar plot, but only looking at the mean expression we get over these hundreds of cells we analyzed. So separating the expression into the transcriptional dynamics actually refined our view on how genes are expressed and allowed us to, to map back uh, parts of the regulation back onto the genome. We can also learn that if you compare two cell types to each other, fibroblasts to embryonic stem cells that are they're very, very different, of course, but, and if you just bin genes by the expression they have, the difference in expression between the two cell types, we can also see is it the burst frequency or size that give rise to most of the expression differences we have between cell types. And this is a log two scale, so the burst frequency have a much more dramatic effect. This goes up to 16 fold here, Whereas the, the burst size, although it has an effect, it's sort of within a fold change of two. So the burst frequency to, to the first approximation is what actually regulates the difference in overall expression between, between cell types. And we could further show, I'm just giving you one example of that here, that the burst frequency information is controlled by the enhancers. And this is one experiment where we had a wild-type cell line, and we look at SOX2 here, which has a strong enhancer downstream of it, and if we remove that enhancer only on one allele, we can infer the kinetics again per allele, as we have done before, and we see that compared to the wild-type or the unaffected allele here, the one that lacks the enhancer has a significantly reduced birth frequency, although no significant change in size. So what we learned from this is a model now on how these regulatory elements are directly influenced in the process of transcription, meaning that enhancers regulate the probability of transcription, how often it will occur, but core promoters, and perhaps many other things that we have not yet identified, regulate the magnitude of each such transcriptional event. And this, so our, our results <coughs> were the first sort of large-scale demonstration of this, that most genes follow this pattern. But there were initial experiments done on individual genes with other methods, where they also have come to the conclusion that enhancers seem to regulate probability, but that was, as I said, yeah, based on individual gene. So this is all good. If you want to understand the regulatory code in genomes, we need to know where are our genes expressed. And I think that we can solve nowadays with single cell RNA sequencing that we broadly apply over whole organisms and model organisms. So we will know when sort of transcription occurs. Uh, work that has been done, not in my lab, but in the research community, has shown ways how to perform very analogous sort of identification of the regulatory regions that are active. Uh, also reaching recently a single cell level so I can use a method called single-cell attack seek, which simply identifies the parts of our genome that is accessible, which normally correlates well with having activity. And this is work from the Chanduri Trapna lab. Again, each, each dot here is an individual cell, but now grouped according to similarities in which regulatory regions are active or, or accessible or not. And even more recent work that's from the Hennikoff lab shows another very elegant way of even more precisely mapping the different uh, activity levels of, of regions of the genomes in individual cells. So we have at least two parts coming along here. We know how to find the genes. We will be able to identify, even though they are a few years behind, the regulatory regions that are active in each cell type in the whole, whole body. With that, we only need I think the, the most pressing information on which transcription factor and cofactors and what levels do we have in all of these cells. And that's something that is clearly lagging behind dramatically, but something that might still become, become possible <coughs> within coming years. So with that, 
I would just like to conclude by, by thanking primarily all the current <coughs> and former members of my lab, which have thought hard and worked hard and giving a lot of heart into their work and made the lab a very fantastic place to, to have. And also a thanks to collaborators and colleagues here at the Karolinska and elsewhere, and all the funders, of course, that, that fund the work we do in the lab. With that, I thank you for coming here, and uh, I hope you have some questions. until you sequence the cells? Yeah, it's a very good question. Um, we think that, I mean, things, changes will occur. There might be stress responses turning on in cells as you, this, you know, destroy the tissue and take out individual cells. Still, it's a very small perturbation. Their whole identity profile seems very unaltered. And that we know from comparing these kind of experiments to simply going directly in the tissue with in situ sequencing or stinging molecular RNA fish or more high throughput ways of looking at many genes simultaneously in tissues. Mm. So it's not this huge problem, I would say. How long does it take? To do what? From, from uh, isolation to sequencing? Isolation to sequencing. So it depends a lot on the tissues. So, I mean, the brain is hard to digest because of all you know, long extremities, and some organs are fairly easy. I mean, if you go into the blood and take immune cells, you don't really have to separate anything. So then it's merely like, I mean, maybe the, the most methods takes maybe two days from having a cell suspension until you can put the, the sequencing libraries on, on the sequencing machine. And now there are strategies for doing you know, tens of thousands of cells in, in individual experiments. But what I forgot to say, which I was actually trying to say in the right at the end there, is that the tools we have available nowadays, I mean, are fantastic. I mean, 10 years ago, there was no chance to even, I think, to even start thinking about solving some of these problems. But having access to this, I mean, actually gives us, for the first time, some kind of a chance to systematically try to address them. So, there's a lot to do.